Hi everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica. I am the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight is one of the students and a familiar face who I will let introduce himself. Hi, uh, my name is Eli. I'm a physics and astronomy student at UMD. So tonight, uh, we are going to be taking you on a tour of the constellations, but with a little bit more grit and grime involved. Uh, if you've been to the planetarium, seen any of our star shows, or gone to any of the, or watched any of the star shows we've streamed over the past few months, um, you've probably heard a lot of stories. But what you may not know is most of these stories have been very heavily edited so that they are family friendly. Um, so we figured what better time than Halloween to do a you know bit more of a grittier version of this, uh, which is why this show is um, PG-13, because we are going to be getting into uh, some little bit gruesome stuff that goes on. Uh, but we're excited to share some of the, the more, more real versions of these stories. Um, now, even with this PG-13 version, there's still been some editing. Um, there are still some stories that we cannot tell um, without giving this an R rating. Um, and we didn't want to go quite that far. So let me get switched over to our night sky. And I'm going to try and have some background music on to make this, you know, a little bit more spooky. Um, if it ends up being a bit too loud, just let us know. Um, this is the first time I'm trying to do this with some background music. All right. So we are going to be taking our tour of the Bloody Skies using the Stellarium program that we use for all of our star shows. And you can find a link to download that for yourself in the comments. It's completely free. It's a great little program. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the show, be sure to leave them in the comments. Eli will be watching those and will let me know if anything pops up. But with that, and one last warning that this is a PG-13 show, um, let's get into it. And the very first story that we are going to tell tonight is actually about the night sky itself. And this one comes to us from Babylonian mythology. Um, and so they told in Babylonian mythology that when you are looking up at the night sky, you're actually looking at half of the corpse of a great dragon that is above you. So the story starts off with um, the first divine beings that were in existence. We have uh, Tiamat, who is the divine being of the sea, uh, Apsu, who is the divine being of fresh water, and then Mumu, who is the divine being for the mist, which kind of comes from both um, Tiamat and Apsu. Now, Tiamat and Apsu um, had children, and they turned out to be uh, quite demonic little monsters that Tiamat and Apsu realized really probably should not actually be alive. Um, and so Apsu ends up suggesting to Tiamat that maybe, maybe they should kill their children because you know, they're causing problems. Uh, well, at first, Tiamat refused. So Apsu uh, went to plan his murder spree to kill all of their children. But before he could kill all of them, one of their children ended up killing Apsu um, instead. And this child decided to then build a palace on the remains of their parent, uh, and then ended up having a kid of their own named Marduk. Um, now, Tiamat was really angry about this, not just the, you know, killing of their sibling, um, but also, you know, the, the disrespect of building your monument on top of their dead corpse. And so Tiamat started to um, raise an army to enact his revenge. But by this point, um, the, the original child who had killed Apsu was dead, so he was enacting his revenge on their child, um, Marduk. Well, he went to go face him, and their armies of the two collided, uh, fought, and it came down to just the final two, to Tiamat and Marduk. Well, Tiamat 
ended up um, not in the best situation because Marduk, who was uh, had control of kind of storms, he used his wind powers to hold Tiamat's mouth open, and then he shot just a barrage of arrows down his throat and killed him. Uh, and so with that one, Marduk ended up building... Uh, the universe, and to do this, he cut the corpse of his grandmother, of Tiamat, in half, and used that to build the dome of the sky. And so all of these stars we're seeing are those holes where those arrows that were shot down her throat pierced her from the inside out. Um, so yeah, there is your night sky, the, the half a corpse of a dead, arrow-ridden god. Um, <laughs> so, um, the next story that we're going to tell involves this famous grouping of stars, which to us is generally known as the Big Dipper, uh, and is part of a larger grouping of stars that most people know as Ursa Major, or the Big Bear, but to the Ojibwe, this is actually the Fisher which I think makes a lot more sense because, you know, we have a long tail here, which a fisher actually has and a bear doesn't. Uh, and the rest of it's pretty much the same. We have back legs, front legs, and then the head coming out here. Um, so the fisher is up in the sky because he was brutally murdered by his brother. Um, fisher, fisher's brother was kind of in charge of the seasons, and the villagers realized that winter was lasting just way too long. And so they asked Fisher to go talk to his brother and just kind of find out what's going on. And he realized when he got there that his brother was holding the summer birds hostage. And that's why summer wasn't coming. Uh, and so he confronts his brother. They get into this big argument. Uh, Fisher ends up winning that kind of disagreement and sets the summer birds free. Seasons change. The people are happy except for his brother, who is furious at Fisher. And so he kind of, while Fisher is walking away, sneaks up on, on him and murders him on the spot for setting those birds free. Um, and that is how Fisher ended up up in the sky for his um, sacrifice, we'll say, to help bring the seasons about. All right, if we head over here... We can now find this big kind of sideways W in the sky. Now you might know her as the Queen Cassiopeia, but there are a few other tales involving this grouping of stars. Uh, now to the Yakima, this is the Great Elkskin. So this is another kind of story involving murder, which makes sense for bloody skies, right? Uh, and so um, what happened here is there were five brothers. Four of them went off hunting to try and find um, some elk to get meat and skin for clothing and all of this. And they weren't having any luck. Um, and in their search, the four brothers came across this old man who they asked for some help. Can you point us in the right direction? He said, sure, I can do that. But uh, in order to do so, you're going to have to give me your arrows. And so they end up giving him his arrows, and he trades them some in return. What they don't realize, though, is that while theirs are really good arrows, the ones that he gave them were horrible, very, very bad. Uh, and so he points them off in a direction, and while they walk off, they don't see that he actually turns himself into a giant elk, charges after them, and uh stampedes, not stampedes, tramples, tramples them to death. Um, now, remember I said there were five brothers, and only four went on this trip. So there's one brother left at home, the youngest brother. And when his brothers don't return home, he goes off searching for them, comes across the same old man. But unlike his four older brothers, he realizes that uh, there's something else going on here. He doesn't quite trust this old man. Um, and so what he ends up doing is hiding in the bushes. And he sees the old man turn into the elk and kind of come out to find the brother and kill him like he did his other brothers. 
uh, well, the gummy bear was ready for this, and he drew his arrow, and he shot the elk five times, uh, one for each of his brothers and one for himself. And that is that elk skin up in the sky. The, um, another story, though, which I think is a little bit more gruesome, comes to us from um, the Arabics, where they see this grouping of stars as the tinted hand. And the uh, story goes that this is the bloody hand of Fatima, who was caught stealing, and her punishment was to have her hand chopped off. And so that is the warning up in the sky to anyone of what would happen to them if they steal. You have this bloody hand up in the sky. All right. Now, below our queen slash elk skin slash bloody hand is this grouping of stars here known um, to most people as Perseus. Uh, and so we can kind of have, here's his head, his body, legs, and his arms kind of outstretched because he's holding on to something. Now, if you've been to any of our shows, you may know one of the stories that Perseus is involved in, and that's the, the rescue of the princess Andromeda. But we don't often tell the story of Perseus himself, just his involvement in the story with Andromeda. And so I wanted to actually go back and tell you the story of Perseus. So, it was foretold to the king of Argos that his grandson would someday kill him. So he locked his daughter up in a tower so that she would never become pregnant. Well, unfortunately, um, this didn't work because Zeus kind of fell in love with her, turned himself into this golden rain that rained into this tower where he and uh, Dane ended up making a child. Um, so she becomes pregnant with what will become Perseus. Well, after she gives birth to her son, the king of Argus threw both her and Perseus into a chest, which he then threw out to sea. They ended up landing on an island and became slaves to a local farmer on that island. Well, when Perseus was about 20, many of the men in the village decided that they wanted to marry his mother, but his mother didn't want to marry any of them. And he wanted to defend her and defend her choice to not wed any of these men. And so these would-be suitors told Perseus that if they brought them the head of Medusa, that he would leave his mother, they would leave his mother alone. And if you don't know, Medusa was this beast of a creature with snakes for hair and had this power that if you looked her in the eyes, you got turned to stone. So definitely not an easy task. Um, so Perseus ends up... Attempting to go on this mission, he prays to the gods for help and ends up getting a very shiny shield from Athena. Uh, and so he takes his winged horse, Pegasus, off to find Medusa. And he ends up using the shield to reflect Medusa's um, image back to her. So she essentially looks in her own eyes and then turns herself into stone. Uh, and then Perseus uh, lops off her stone head and carries it back with him. And that's what he's holding here. That is the head of Medusa. Um, now, once he gets back to the island, um, these would-be suitors decide that um, they're, they're not actually going to fulfill their promise, and they keep harassing his mother. And so he goes on a bit of a murder spree and decides to just kill all of the suitors so that he could keep his mother safe. Um, but that is the story of Perseus. All right. If we head around the other direction, we can see this, what right now, this time of year looks like a U in the sky, but also can kind of look like a backward C. Um, this is known as Corona Borealis, uh, the Northern Crown. And this is generally associated with uh, Princess Arden of Crete. Um, so her father had the Minotaur creature um, locked up in a giant labyrinth. Um, so the Minotaur was half man, half bull. 
um, and to keep the Minotaur appeased, what her father, the king of Crete, would do was he would get sacrifices from the nearby villages to um, send into the labyrinth to feed the Minotaur and keep it basically appeased. Well, one of these would-be sacrifices, uh, the princess ended up falling in love with. And so she gave him a way to survive. She gave him a weapon, and she gave him this kind of magic thread that he could leave uh, along his trail so that he could find his way out of the labyrinth. So he was able to kill the Minotaur, make his way back out. He collects the princess with him, and they supposedly are about to set off to be happily ever after, except that is not what happens. Um, this... <laughs> This guy is actually not a nice guy, and he completely abandons her on a deserted island um, and just goes off on his freedom. Um, yeah, so not, not really a happy fairy tale ending there for our poor princess. All right, next to our princess, or the crown of our princess, we'll say, sits uh, Hercules. And I am having, oh, there he is, Hercules. And let me, I could have done this to start. There he is. There is Hercules. So he's kind of upside down right now. We have his body and then his legs kind of going out. So many of you may be familiar with um, the character of Hercules, uh, especially if you've seen the Disney movie. Um, and again, that story of Hercules has been very, very heavily edited. Um, by the film creators to make it, you know, family friendly. Um, so Hercules is the son of Zeus and someone who was not Zeus's wife, Hera. And of course, Hera is very upset about this. Um, he thinks she'd be used to it, but no. So um, what... Hera ends up doing it to kind of take her revenge out on Hercules and on Zeus um, is once Hercules is old enough to kind of have a wife and a family of his own, she ends up uh, making him temporarily insane. And in his insanity, he ends up murdering his wife and his children. Once the insanity kind of goes away, and he sees what he's done, he becomes absolutely distraught and tries to kill himself. Um, now, he is stopped by a friend who sends him to a kind of friend of a friend who happens to be a king. Uh, and the king tells him that he can be forgiven for this heinous, murderous crime um, by completing these 12 seemingly impossible tasks. And that is what you may know of as the 12 labors that Hercules had to go through. Um, so one of these is to slay the Nemean lion, um, who is actually Leo up in the sky. And I'll show you that in a little bit. He's not up uh, right now. Um, but the, the impossible thing about the Nemean lion is uh, this is a magical lion with skin that cannot be pierced. So you can't stab him, you can't shoot him with an arrow, slash him with a sword, anything like that. So he was considered to be immortal um, because the, there didn't seem to be a method capable of killing it. Well, Hercules, of course, has great strength. And so he literally strangles the Nemean lion and kills it. Um, then decides to skin the lion and wear the skin as kind of a trophy cape thing, which actually made everyone more terrified of him because he has killed the seemingly immortal creature. So that didn't help. Um, another labor was to slay the nine headed Hydra, um, who's also up in the sky, but not right now. I'll show you in a little bit. Um, now, the Hydra was difficult to kill for multiple reasons. I mean, one, it has nine heads, but it also has this power that if you chop off one of its heads, two more grow back in its place. Um, and because Hercules had succeeded in killing the Nemea lion, and Hera did not want him to survive these trials, she ended up sending this little crab who is up in the sky as Cancer. Again, I'll show you once he's up. 
um, to kind of nip at his heels. Um, but unfortunately for Cancer, Hercules didn't really notice him and ended up uh, stepping on him and squashing him, which is why Hera put the crab up in the sky for his sacrifice. Um, but yeah, those are some of the, the tasks that he ends up having to do, um, all because he went insane and murdered his wife and children. Definitely not a Disney story there. All right, now next to Hercules is this guy who is named Ophiuchus. You may recognize that name. This is the mysterious 13th Zodiac constellation that kind of made the news several years ago. Um, and his story is, honestly, I think one of my favorites that I'm going to tell tonight. And it's one that I just learned recently. Um, so Ophiuchus, um, in one story, is associated with um, Erisython, who is the ancient king of Thessaly. Now, according to the story, this uh, king led a group of men into a grove of trees that was sacred to the goddess Demeter and cut down all of those trees and to end up you know, building this king's temple. Well, Demeter, of course, is very upset by this, and so she curses the king with a hunger that would never be satisfied. And so he would gorge himself on banquet after banquet. Banquet after banquet. That's difficult to say. Um, he would gorge himself over and over and over again and never feel full, still feel like he's starving. He would drink wine nonstop and still feel like he is dying of thirst. The more he ate, the hungrier he got, the worse it got. Um, when he had nothing left in his palace to eat, um, he and his family were forced to leave to try and find him food. Uh, and in this whole mess, um, he got very low in money as they're buying more and more and more food to try and feed his insatiable hunger. So he ends up selling his own family into slavery just to get some more food to try and satisfy this never-ending hunger. That doesn't work. You know, he still is getting hungrier and hungrier. Um, and so finally, he is out of food, he is out of money, hungrier than ever, and he has no other option but to start eating his own flesh. And uh, the more of his own flesh that he eats, the less painful his appetite becomes. So the more and more of himself he eats, the more satiated he feels. And this hunger finally starts to fade a little bit. So he keeps literally eating himself. Um, and he ends up pretty much eating himself to death. Um, just before he dies, um, because the gods weren't really ready to let him off the hook yet, they end up wrapping him with um, a giant snake and placing him in the sky so that he could no longer eat any more of his flesh and he'd have to live up in the stars with the rest of this insatiable hunger that hadn't been fully cured yet. And that's why you can see him kind of wrapped in the snake here. Um, definitely, whew, that's, that's a gruesome story. Um, my favorite, as I said. <laughs> um, now, up here in the sky, we have this harp known as Lyra. And we have told the story of Orpheus in the past, who is the owner of the harp, uh, of the harp named Lyra. But we've only told part of his story. So we always start the story with Orpheus is a great harp player, beloved by many, whose wife suddenly passes away. And then we skip forward to there. The part that we're skipping, though, is quite a tale where Orpheus tries to win his wife back by actually heading down to the underworld. And so he takes his harp, he finds an entrance to the underworld, heads down, now, the gates into the underworld are guarded by the three-headed dog, Cerberus. And to get past them, Orpheus plays his harp to lull the great beast to sleep and ends up making his way in to find his wife. And he finds his wife, who is being guarded by Hades, the god of the underworld. 
So Orpheus tries the same tactic as he did with Cerberus. He tries to um, play the harp and lull Hades to sleep so that they can escape. Well, Hades is loving the harp playing, but isn't falling asleep. And so Orpheus stops, and Hades is like, um, no, keep going. Also, you're not leaving here ever, and I'm putting your wife somewhere else so that you don't get to be with her, because that's, you know, the whole thing. You're separated by death now, but I'm not going to keep you prisoner and as my harp player. Um, so... Orpheus and Hades kind of have this bickering, and they end up coming up with an agreement. If um, Hades will let Orpheus take his wife back up and let her live, he would come back down and spend eternity playing the harp for Hades. Um, and Hades ended up agreeing to this, but there was a catch. In order for this to work, as Orpheus and his wife were heading back up out of the underworld, Orpheus could not look back behind him to look at his wife. He had to just keep looking forward until they were out of the underworld, back up on Earth. And this may seem like a seemingly simple task, except as they're going up, he keeps hearing these cries from behind him. And he keeps getting worried that something is happening to his wife. And eventually he becomes so overwhelmed with this fear, even though they're like steps away from making it out, he turns around. And as he turns around, he sees his wife getting dragged back down into the underworld by these ghastly creatures. And she screams for his help, but there's nothing he can do. And so he ends up back on Earth without his wife. And then we pick up to the story that we usually tell, where Orpheus is then um, murdered by the villagers because he didn't want to bury anyone else and uh, dismembered and his body parts strewn all across the land. Uh, yeah, that's, that's poor Orpheus. Not, not a good, not a good time for him. All right, um, so we're getting a little bit low on time, but I want to do a couple more. Um, but these are up kind of later in the night. So what I'm going to do is speed up time. So that our next set of constellations can come up. And so what I'm looking for are the winter constellations. And they're just about up. You can see Orion, who we'll talk about. There's plenty of stories about him. Um, but to start, we are actually going to start with this group of stars and these two stars. These are Canis Major the big dog, and Canis Minor, the little dog. And you may notice that between them is this kind of fuzzy arch that arcs across the sky, which is the Milky Way galaxy. Now, to many, many cultures, the Milky Way galaxy uh, is actually seen as the bridge that carries spirits into the um, afterlife. Um, and in particular, to the, I don't have the name, um, to a culture that I apparently forgot to write down the name for, and I apologize, uh, these two dogs actually act as guardians uh, of this pathway to the afterlife. Um, and it's said that if you want to actually make it past them to the land of the souls, you have to bring them food. Uh, if you don't, then you will get stuck in a kind of limbo and won't make it to, you know, a, a nice peaceful afterlife. Um, and so the people are buried with this food uh, to give as a sacrifice to the guard dog so that they can make their way across the bridge to the afterlife. All right, I promised Orion. Um, so this is what most people know as uh, Orion the Hunter. You have his shoulders, his belt, his knees, and then he's either holding a shield and a club, 
or this is a bow, and he's holding on to some arrows here. Now, Orion has quite a mini story about him. Most involve him trying to chase the ladies um, and win affections in one way or another. Um, but the story I'm going to tell you tonight is one of his more devious um, adventures. Uh, so in this story, Orion fell in love with Merope, who is the beautiful daughter of a king. And she, like most of the ladies that he pursues, did not return his affections. Well, this time around, Orion, when he had a little bit too much to drink one night, decided to try and force himself on Merope. Um, the king was furious, obviously, um, and in his fury, grabs Orion by his head, and, um, well, he, he destroys his eyes, uh, he gouges his eyes out with his thumbs, um, so not, not really a, a happy story for Orion there. Um, all right, well, I think... We are at time, so we will leave it with that wonderful story of Orion. Um, so, we hope that you enjoyed these a uh, little bit grittier, grimier um, versions of these constellation stories. Um, Eli, did we have any questions or anything come through? Uh, no, not that I could see. No? All right. Well, if you do have any questions or comments, um, let us know. Um, you can type them in the comments. Let us know what your favorite story was. Um, and if you liked this kind of grittier retelling, uh, retelling of the stories, because uh, if you do, we might do more of these. Um, if, if there's an interest in them, people want to hear more, because there's, there's definitely a lot more. There's a lot more. Um, with that, though, let me tell you a little bit about what's coming up over the next week. So we are, of course, in the midst of Spooktober. Um, next Wednesday, because it's Saturday. Yes, it's Saturday. <laughs> next week on Wednesday, we will be doing the Magical World of Astronomy, which is going to go into all of the uh, astronomical connections between the universe of Harry Potter uh, and our night sky. There's a lot of them, and it's going to be a really fun show. Um, I've a couple of our students that haven't made an appearance yet have been working on this, um, and it's going to be great. So join us next week for that. And then in a week, next Saturday is uh, Halloween. And so we are doing our Halloween outside the planetarium to keep us pandemic safe and, you know, keep our community safe. Um, so the event's going to look different than it has the past two years because we are having it outside. It is going to be a drive through event. Um, but uh, we are encouraging people to stop by and see us. They'll be able to get a goodie bag with some fun activities that you can do at home. Uh, candy, of course. And then we'll also have some demonstrations that you can watch from your car of things that look like they're magic, but can totally be explained by science uh, because science is magical. It, it can look like magic. Uh, and we're also gonna be testing out how strong gravity is at the UMD campus by uh, dropping some pumpkins off the roof. You know, as you do. Um, so yeah, that is coming up over the next week and we're really excited. We'll have some more details out um, closer to the event about where exactly uh, in the parking lot you will drive um, and what times we'll be doing the pumpkin drops because we're not we're gonna do them I think we said like every half hour or something um, but we'll have all those details coming out to you soon but with that unless there's anything else that's come in we will wrap it up for the night so thank you everyone so much for joining us um, if you liked the show let us know and we can do more in the future um, otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and we will see you next week. Bye, everyone.